Marhaban wa ahlan bakum fi baranamij dakhil Washington. Ma'akum mudifakum, Robert Satloff. Asharat awam to ad zamanan tawilan. Kabla asharat awam, ken George Bush. Wa Tony Blair, wa Husni Mubarak, wa Ariel Sharon, jamian, yatawalun el sulta. Kabla asharat awam, lam yakun hunek, min sama'a hatta an Twitter. O Instagram, O Siasi Mahali Mahdud al Shahra fi Illinois, Ismuhu Barack Obama. Kabla Ashrat Awam Kabelik Udiat Ulat Halakat Baranamij Dakhil Washington. Mundu Delik al Hain Badalna Aksa Juhud La Naftah Nafithat Lekum Mushahadena al Arab La Talku Nadrat Ala Washington. Kaif ta'amal, wa kaif kathiran ma la ta'amal. Mundul badeya ken hadafna basitan. Tarifakum ba'ashkhas min kul manahi el hayat el siyansiya fi asamat baladna. Wa ba'd ma yakrub min khamsa miya halaka. Amil antakun ma rafatakum be Washington afdal be kalil min al wakt Eledi Badana Fihi. Khalel al Sabia el Mukbila, Sanarud, Baad el Halakat, el Khasa, Bumunasiba, el Ichtefel, Bil Eid al Asher, Lil Barnamij. Walekin Len Yakun Eyan Minha, Ragham Delek, Fi Khasusia, Istidafa, Awul Daif, Sharik, Fi Barnamij, M. El Fain Wahamsa, Wahua el Sahafi, Alami El Shakra, Thomas Friedman. Tom Laysa Mujarad Sahafi, Ragham Anuhu Feza Bijazat Pulitzer on Amlihi El Sahafi. Wa Tom Laysa Mujarad Katib Amud, Ragham Anuhu Feza Bijazat Pulitzer Thania on Ta'likatihi El Siasia. Tom Mufakar Baria Wasana Akbar Muhim, Hain Yatahadith. Yansutu Elehi Il Zuama. Havil Sboa Fi Barnamij Dakhil Washington. Yasurni Anurahib Bit Thomas Friedman El Sahafi Fi New York Times. Welcome back to Dakhil Washington. Well, we're celebrating 10 years of this show, and I could not be more delighted than to welcome back our very first guest 10 years ago. Tom Friedman. Tom, thank you very much for joining us. Great to be here. So, Tom, 10 years is a long time. A lot has happened. I suppose one can also say a lot didn't happen. When you first were on the show, 2005, America was in the middle of its great Iraq adventure. And now, um, at the beginning, at least, you supported this. Yes. Why did you support it? Um, I supported it, Rob, for um, not for WMD reasons. Um, I, I actually had no reason to believe he had WMD, and I said, if that's why you're going... Weapons not, not of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction, not for me. I, I supported it for democracy reasons. Uh, I believe that the Arab world needed to, was capable of, and desirous of, building multi-sectarian, multi-ethnic democracy, and that if we could partner with the people of Iraq, in a way, in many ways, the most multi-sectarian, multi-ethnic country in the region, Iraq and Syria, let's say. If we could create an example in Iraq in partnership with the Iraqi people, it would build us a real bridge for the future in the Arab world. That was why I supported the war. I, I look back on it now and I tell people I was for the Arab Spring before there was an Arab Spring. Um, unfortunately, uh, it failed. And, um, uh, and as a result, it's hard not to draw the conclusion now, Rob, that um, uh, basically there were not enough people who shared our agenda. That we thought the alternatives in the Arab world were either democracy or autocracy. And it turns out that the alternatives are order and disorder, at least in the near term. So when we removed the iron fist at the top, what we got was not an evolution toward democracy, what we got was disorder. And that's basically where we are 
10 years later. So when you say it failed, yes. uh, did we fail? Did they fail? Did supporters that we hoped would come in and, and buttress the, the experiment fail? Who so failed? That's a good, good question. Uh, everybody failed. Um, there weren't enough people who wanted it to succeed. So the way I look at the Arab world in general is that it is a pluralistic region that lacked pluralism, okay? So it was pluralistic in character, Sunni, Shiites, Christians, Kurds, Jews, Turkmen, Alawis, Yazidis, but they lacked pluralism, an ethic. What does that mean? An ethic of living together without um, external force. So because it was a pluralistic region that lacked pluralism, it was always held together vertically by iron fists from the top down. For 500 years, it was Ottoman Turks. Then uh, for 50 years, it was colonial powers, Britain and France. And then it was kings, colonels, and dictators. What we did when we came in was we removed the last iron fist, the kings, colonels, and dictators in Iraq and Libya. The people did it in Yemen and Syria. And once you, once you have a pluralistic region that lacks pluralism and you take away the iron fist that governs it vertically from the top down, it means it can only be governed horizontally, therefore, by different communities forging social contracts for how to live together horizontally as equal citizens. So if you step back, what we're really seeing is a giant region try to go from vertical control, hundreds and hundreds of years of vertical control, to horizontal control. Now when you go from vertical to horizontal, you can do that if you have one of three aids, one of three you know, helpers. One is if you have a Mandela, a local leader who can really bring people from vertical to horizontal, to living together as equal citizens. Turned out there was no Mandela. Second is if you have a far-sighted military. We hope the Egyptian military would play that role in Egypt to make the transition from vertical control. They didn't. Third is if you have a midwife. That was the role America, the NATO were supposed to play, to, to midwife the transition from vertical to horizontal governance. If you have no Mandela, no military, and no midwife, you have disorder and you have ISIS. The reason I say that it was everybody's fault, partly we didn't know what we were doing, partly the region, Saudi Arabia, Syria, none of them wanted us to succeed. They did everything they could to make us fail. Iran wanted us to fail. And lastly, there were local forces, Rob, that we've never met before. Local jihadis who so wanted us to fail, they didn't even care if they succeeded. That is, I remember a day in Iraq where there was a man, a suicide bomber of a funeral in a mosque during Ramadan. I think of all the gates that person went through, a suicide bombing of a funeral in a mosque during the holy month of Ramadan. That is someone who didn't care whether, we, we have never faced an enemy, not in Vietnam, not in the Cold War, who didn't care if they succeeded, didn't care of how many of their own people they killed. They only cared that the democratic project must fail. And you put all those together, and it turned out to be a bridge too far. So at the beginning of the war, I asked, is Iraq the way Iraq is because Saddam was the way Saddam was? Or was Saddam the way Saddam was because Iraq was the way Iraq is? And sadly, I have to conclude now, it was the latter. That's a very, very depressing conclusion. Um, it, it's, I, I can't come to any other alternative. You see, in Eastern Europe, when the, when, the, when the stone was lifted from the people with the end of the uh, Cold War, what we saw was 95% of the people shared the same agenda. They wanted to be free, to be more democratic. When the stone of Saddam and Bashar, or, or you know, Ali Abdullah Saleh, or Gaddafi was lifted in the Arab world, what we found was some people truly wanted to be free, to be equal citizens with equal responsibilities. But some other people wanted to be free to be more sectarian. Some people wanted to be free to be more tribal. Some people wanted to be free to be more Islamist. 
And the group that wanted to be free to be more democratic and equal citizens, it's not that they weren't there. Not that they didn't lead the Arab Spring in some of these countries. They were not strong enough. You know, I've always said in the Arab world, the Middle East, Middle East, because it includes Israel, extremists go all the way and moderates tend to just go away. So when these lids are taken off, the most organized and toughest force always wins. And too often, in too few occasions, that wasn't the liberals, the, the Democrats, Tunisia's the rare example, it was actually the Islamists and the autocrats. So if you put Tunisia aside for a moment, are you now very pessimistic about the prospects for liberal, pluralistic life, let alone democracy, uh, more broadly in this part of the world? Well, I always knew it was going to um, take a long time and be a hard struggle. You know, if anyone actually read what I wrote leading up to the Iraq War, I always knew it was going to be hard. But um, I, I have to, to say, I think it's a 50-year it's a project. And it has to start with them. It can't start with us. You know, I've always believed that the Middle East only puts a smile on your face when it starts with them. Okay, the Anbar uprising started with them, and Petraeus and company met them and, and, and helped elevate them. The Camp David peace treaty started with a secret meeting between Egyptians and Israelis in Morocco. Oslo, Oslo's not called Dayton, it's called Oslo, because it started between Israelis and Palestinians. We found out about it a year later. So when it starts with them, you have the most important engine of change, the only sustainable engine of change, that is, it is a self-sustaining energy. Because what starts with them can be self-sustaining. When it starts with us, that's when you hear, to me, the scariest word to me in geopolitics in the Middle East. We just need to train a few more people. <laughs> okay? When every, well, check your wallet, oh my God, is it still here? When someone comes along and says, we just need to train a few more people. We didn't train enough people. Who trained al-Nusra? Who trained al-Qaeda? Who trained the Anbar uprisers or, or originally? Um, who's training ISIS? I mean, it's about the will, not the way. And when we substitute our will, we don't get the way. Okay, when we come back, we're going to ask Tom to move from the discussion of the, uh, the failures of the democratic experiment to whether globalization has made any serious inroads in this part of the world in just a moment. Thomas L. Friedman is almost certainly the world's most influential journalist. He doesn't just report the news, his words make the news. He's been awarded the Pulitzer Prize three times for his work with the New York Times, where he serves as the foreign affairs columnist with a license to roam the globe and offer insights and observations on just about anything. His career has included tours as the Times correspondent in Beirut and Jerusalem, as well as its diplomatic, business, and White House correspondent. Over the decades, he has covered wars and disasters, peace deals and presidents, and some of the greatest innovators in their inventions and history. He's a best-selling author, multiple times over, with works that have brought the horrors of war and the wonders of globalization directly to the bedside tables of the great and not so great around the world. A native of the truly great state of Minnesota and America's Midwest, he received degrees from Brandeis University and the University of Oxford. When he isn't traveling or playing golf, he lives in Bethesda, Maryland with his wife. So Tom, you wrote a book, um, 15 years ago, called The Lexus and the Olive Tree, that, uh, that contrasted uh, the, uh, the great technolo technological innovations in Asia and elsewhere with, with old rivalries, especially in the Middle East, yeah. Sunni Shiite, Arab Israeli. Yeah. Now we're 15 years later. Um, is the Lexus still over there and the olive tree still stuck in the Middle East? That book looks pretty good <laughs> 15 years later, I must say. You know, I should go back, Rob, and tell you, wh where did that title come from? I was on a, the bullet train. I'd, I had gone to Japan, and um, I was on the bullet train going from the Lexus factory in Toyota City, south of Tokyo, um, back to Tokyo. And I had just watched them make 
Alexis, almost entirely with robots. And um, I was just blown away by what I'd seen. This was early age of robots. This was 15 years ago. And I was on the train and I was reading the International Herald Tribune that day. And there was a story that Margaret Tutwiler, the then State Department spokeswoman, had made a statement about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that changed a word somewhere here. The, and both sides were up in arms. And I was looking out the window as I'm going 180 miles an hour or whatever on this bullet train, coming from the Lexus factory. And I thought to myself, these people over here are building the greatest luxury car in the world today with robots. And these people over here are still fighting over who owns which olive tree. So if we connect this pretty depressing assessment yes. of the potential for pluralism in the Middle East with this pretty depressing assessment of the Middle East being outside the globalization train, not 100%, but to a great extent, this isn't uh, the, uh, suggest a very hopeful future for more than 350 million people. Well, the way I see the world today, Rob, is that um, I'm always carrying around in my head a theory of how the machine works. So the machine is my shorthand for what are the biggest forces shaping more things in more places, in more ways, on more days. Because as a columnist, you always want to have an idea of how you think the machine works so you can take your column and move the machine. And if you don't know how it works, you'll move it either in the wrong direction or not at all. So here's what I think the machine consists of today. What is really shaping the world is that the three largest forces on the planet, which I call the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law, are all in a simultaneous, nonlinear acceleration. So what do I mean by that? Moore's Law is the law coined by Gordon Moore, one of the co-founders of Intel, that the speed and power of microchips will double every 24 months. Okay? Um, the market for me is globalization, and Mother Nature is climate change, biodiversity loss, and population growth. Now, if you put all three of those on a graph, what you'll see is, and we know this, what's going on with technology, we now have self-driving cars. We have computers that can beat anyone in chess, and we're just at the beginning. That's a sign that the doubling and doubling and doubling of power of microchips is going like this now. Globalization, the world has gone from interconnected to interdependent. The Chinese stock market suddenly starts to go kaflui, and you and I lost 10% of our 401ks in the space of a month. Our retirement benefits. Our retirement benefits, yeah. exactly. Because of something that happened in China, because they had a bubble. We have never been more interdependent. Globalization looks like this. And lastly, Mother Nature. Um, uh, climate change, biodiversity loss, and population. Let's always remember, the Syrian uprising was both a political event and a climate event. Syria experienced the worst drought, the worst four-year drought in its modern history between basically 2006 and 2010. A million Syrian farmers and herders left their homes, flocked to the cities, completely overwhelmed the infrastructure. Assad did nothing for them. Then they got on their cell phones, basically, and connected with the people doing the Arab Spring, and they blew the lid off the place. I went to Raqqa province, home of ISIS now, uh, a year and a half ago, and interviewed climate refugees there who told us the story. The Syrian revolution started in the two driest spots in the country, Dara and Kamishli. So you see how these forces come together now. And what they're doing is they're stressing strong countries, the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law, like ours, and they're blowing up weak countries. And the countries they're blowing up first are those whose borders are primarily straight lines. Libya, Syria, Yemen, Iraq, Somalia, Chad, Mali. They're the most artificial countries. And what they're doing, therefore, is creating a new divide in the world that's no longer north-south, no longer east-west, no longer communist-capitalist. The new divide in the world is between the world of disorder, all these countries blowing up, and the world of order. And what you see in the news today is basically thousands, tens of thousands, possibly millions of people clamoring to get out of the world of disorder into the world of order. Think about Israel. If I blindfold you, Rob, if I put a blindfold on your eyes, I'd say, Rob, we're taking a trip. 
And I take the blindfold off. I say, we're now at a central bus station. And you look around and all you see are African males between the ages of 18 and 25 on their cell phones. I say, Rob, where are we? You say, Tom, we're at the Nairobi Central Bus Station. I say, no, 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 Rob. We're at the Tel Aviv Central Bus Station because Israel has received over 15,000 Eritreans, South Sudanese, Ethiopians who have literally walked from the world of disorder across Sinai to get into Israel. They've managed to get their way into Israel, and many of them have collected around the Tel Aviv Central Bus Station. Israel doesn't know what to do with them. We're going to hold that thought. We're going to come back to our second segment with Tom Friedman to talk about order, disorder, and a bit about American politics. Tom, thank you. Bahada Nasilu il Nehayat Habahil Halka min Baranamaj Dakil Washington. Either Kenneth Ladekum, Ayat Ta'ali Kat, O Istaf Sarat, Ladefi Thomas Friedman, Arju An Turasaluha Eleya Mubasharatan, Allah Anwan al Barid al Electroni Ateli, Inside Washington at elhura.com. Ma kum Robert Satloff, Shukran Lakum wa Ila Lakam.